Hello and welcome to another Mission Wilderness. As always, I'm Shane and my mission is to bring you deeper into the wilderness with trip videos, educational content, and gear reviews. This mission brings us to the South Hagman entry point of the 1.1 million acre Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. It is May 22nd, 2022, and this is the winter that will not quit. It actually snowed on my way to the entry point this morning. And the current temperature is probably somewhere in the upper 50s. It's going to get down to as low as 30 degrees tonight. And this area just experienced a freeze about two or three days ago. A freeze that killed off all of the mosquitoes and has prevented the black flies from hatching. And it looks as though it's going to continue to be cold over the course of the next couple of days with highs in the lower 60s and lows down into the low 40s and into the upper 30s. I entered South Hagman Lake at about 2 p.m. this afternoon and I've heard good things about South Hagman Lake and it did not disappoint. It is a beautiful, beautiful lake. There is a lot of exposed granite around the shores and the shore is populated by a relatively mature pine and spruce forest. And my intention was to camp on South Hagman tonight before beginning my missions in earnest tomorrow. And although South Hagman is a front country lake, I am the only camper on this lake. And I have three missions. The first mission is to visit the pictographs on North Hagman Lake. The second mission is to accomplish the infamous 428 rod portage from North Hagman Lake to Angleworm Lake. And the third mission is to hike some miles on the Angleworm Trail. So these are three pretty exciting and fun missions that are packed into just a couple of days. The pictographs are among the most popular pictographs in the Boundary Waters. They are often visited because of their easy proximity to the Echo Trail. So it is a necessary stop for anybody who is a Boundary Waters enthusiast to check out the North Hagman pictographs. The second mission, the 428 rod portage from North Hagman, uh, technically Treese Lake, to Angleworm Lake is the 10th largest portage in the Boundary Waters, but many people consider it to be the most difficult. I read one review where the reviewer said that they had PPSD, post portage stress disorder and uh, and the descriptions are just horrifying apparently the biggest obstacle is mud and in this relatively wet spring it should be even a little worse than it normally is and uh, but tomorrow afternoon i'll hike the angleworm trail i won't hike the entire angleworm trail the entire angleworm trail is 13 miles and uh, it's infamous for getting people turned around and lost on it so i will hike the the most well marked part of the trail and after accomplishing those three missions, I will take that 428 rod portage back and then head back down south again. So those are the three missions for this May 22nd, 2022 trip into the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Uh, so far today, I've just really been enjoying this campsite, but I'm really happy to be here tonight. It's a beautiful campsite. It's quiet lake. It's the wind is starting to die down. Uh, earlier it was kind of kicked up a little bit, which is another great feature of this campsite is that it's in the lee of the northwest wind and the wind typically comes from the northwest. So all day long while it's been windy on the other side of the point, it's just been super calm uh, on the campsite. So I've been enjoying myself. Uh, I didn't have a lot planned for today other than to just come out and camp. The only thing I have left to do is, is I've got a, a good first night supper planned. I brought in three brats and some buns and I picked up some mayonnaise and some ketchup packets at McDonald's on the way in this morning. So next up is supper. <laughs>
got a great view of the southeast. I've got a great view of the northwest. Great view of the sunset. But to be honest, I have to admit that today I got a little rattled. You know, real talk. Mission Wilderness real talk right now. I had planned on camping at South Hagman all along. That was the plan for today, and so I was kind of taking my time. So I kind of took it easy this morning. And, you know, I thought I had everything ready. But I got to the entry point. I poured it to 80 rods down to the water. I got everything packed up and ready to jump into the canoe. And I realized at the last moment, I don't have my paddles. <laughs> so I had zero paddles and zero ability to start the trip when I arrived at the landing after portaging any rod. And that rattles me. That rattles me to think that I would forget something so important. I mean, it, it delayed me about two hours. I had to drive back to Ely and I, I found a paddle, but I only have one paddle and I usually like to have two because you never know when you might accidentally drop your paddle. And it's doubly dangerous when you're in cold water like this. Because if I lose my paddle when I'm in the boat, it's not like I can just jump in the water and get the paddle. It's not going to stop me from taking my trip. It doesn't change my missions. The missions are the same. So I'm looking forward to a good trip. We are back on the water. Saw some great things this morning. I saw a whiskey jack hanging around the camp. Uh, the whiskey jack, that is the Canadian jay, that is the gray jay. It looked like the gray jay was looking for a handout of some kind. While I was uh, preparing my breakfast, the gray jay tried to land on my stove while I was boiling some water. And uh, I didn't see much of the gray jay after that. I did see uh, some warblers there. I was just kind of hanging out. So we're headed to the pictographs. This is the first time that I will ever see pictographs. I didn't want to see them until I knew more about them. So I educated myself a little bit before I decided to take my first trip to visit pictographs. And what I learned is that uh, the Ojibwe do not want you to take photographs. I want to respect the Ojibwe's wishes so I won't take photographs or take any video of the pictographs. Now that said, you can find images of the Hagman pictographs all over online. In fact, the moose that is depicted is the uh, Clearwater Lodge's insignia. Well, it, now it does look like I've made it to the Portage Trail. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take care of this portage quickly and then I'll pick up on the other side with uh, some of the stuff that I learned about the pictographs before we actually get there. Right away this morning when the sun came up, it was beautiful. The sky was pretty clear. And since I've been on the water, what's happened is, is that the cumulus clouds have been heaping up. That is, they've been growing and getting taller and they've been getting heavy on the bottom. So um, they've been spitting on me a little bit. And I don't know if it's the sky is going to open up on me at any minute. It could. And it's cool enough that putting on my rain gear doesn't overheat me. Um, one of the things that you'll notice that I, is that my life jacket is underneath my rain gear. When I buy rain gear, for canoeing, I always buy it much bigger than I need. It allows me to put it over the life jacket. My policy is I never take my life vest off until I'm at camp. So I don't take it off for portages. I don't take it off when I have a lunch break. If I'm in the boat, it doesn't matter what the weather is like. It could be 110 degrees in humidity and I could be sweating 
um, terribly, but I will not take my life jacket off if I'm in the boat. And it doesn't matter how deep the water is, nothing. Because the reality is, is that nobody ever plans on dumping. You never do. When it happens, it's always a surprise. And uh, the last thing I want to worry about when I dump is having to swim. So I put some rain gear on. That's the long story short is I threw some rain gear on. I threw it over my PFD. So I'm about to see the pictographs for the first time ever. Up until, you know, just recently, I had no idea what they meant. I had no idea who painted them or why they were painted or what any of the particular signs or symbols meant. And so I figured if I'm going to look at the pictographs, I wanted to educate myself first so that I would know what I was looking at, so that it would be significant. Otherwise, it's just honestly, it, out of context, it just looks like some scribblings on a rock. And so I did some research and I found out some interesting things about the pictographs. The first thing is, is that they were painted by the Ojibwa peoples. There is some scholarly dispute as to who painted them, but the consensus is that it was painted by the Ojibwe peoples. And there, there are two reasons why scholars know or feel pretty certain that the Ojibwe peoples painted them. The first one is geographic and the second one is symbolic. I mean, first of all, geographically, the, there are hundreds of pictographs and they're concentrated in an area north of Lake Huron, north of Lake Superior, and in the Superior Aquatical Wilderness. Uh, fun fact, postscript, is that most of the pictographs, the densest concentrations of pictographs are located here in the Quatico Superior region. But like I say, they're scattered all over north of Lake Huron, north of Lake Superior. And that also coincides with the ancestral lands of the Ojibwa peoples about 400 years ago, which would have been about the time of European contact with the Ojibwa. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's decent evidence, but the really convincing evidence is the symbolic evidence. And, and that is that the signs and symbols that you find on the pictographs are also signs and symbols that are found in the written language of the Ojibwa peoples, which is a picture-based language, or what scholars call iconographic. So the second question about the pictographs is, what do they mean? And it's pretty clear that they have religious significance for the Ojibwe peoples. And there are really two clear reasons why that's true. The first is that the signs and the symbols which are depicted on the pictographs are also found on shamanistic birch bark scrolls. That is, birch bark scrolls that were used by shamans or priests in the Ojibwe religion. Uh, and the second reason is, is simply what they depict. And what they depict is Ojibwe religious traditions. So just like Catholic cathedrals tell the story of Jesus through frescoes and through stained glass and through sculpture and through friezes, etc., the pictographs tell the story of the Ojibwe religious traditions. And so you can discern evidence of the Ojibwe creation story in the pictographs. According to the Ojibwe creation story, Nanabush, who is a kind of savior figure, comes to Earth and then makes it safe for humans. And in addition to that, Nanabush could communicate with the animals and actually take animal form. And he learned how to live from animals. So one of the pictographs that's depicted here on Hagman is, is a common pictograph, or it's a common glyph that you see. And that is, there is an animal, which in this case is a moose, that's being pursued by a wolf. And Nanabush learned how to hunt from wolves and then taught humans how to hunt secondhand. Now, the place where you find the pictographs, it's pretty easy to locate because Hagman is a long north-south running lake. And there's a channel between Hagman and Trees Lake. And it's in that channel that the pictographs are located. There is a large cliff there and the large cliff is located on the western side and it's on that large cliff that you find the pictographs. Wow, that was a really cool experience. The Ojibwe painted the pictographs on cliffs because cliffs are sacred. They are where water, earth and sky meet, all in one location.
And cliffs are also important because cliffs are where the mythical Thunderbird also resides and nests. The other reason that Ojibwe painted their pictographs and put those religious symbols on cliffs is more practical, and that is that they specifically would place them on cliffs where there would be um, a part of the cliff that would stay dry, that would get some sun, uh, at least for some part, of every day. And because uh, there wouldn't be any wetness on the rock, it would be difficult or impossible for lichen to grow there. And so lichen don't grow over pictographs because they are uh, painted on parts of the cliffs where it's dry and inhospitable to lichen growth. And these cliffs are imposing. They're probably 20 or 30 feet tall. And there's an overhang. So they hang above you from the water. And which increases the feeling of them being very imposing. And then the pictographs are just there. It's difficult to describe exactly the feeling that one gets when one looks at a 400-year-old religious artifact from a people whose religion was so intimately tied to this wild place. To this place that, you know, has also inspired a kind of religion of wilderness in American history and in the American kind of mythos. It's almost like there is something that is mythical and mystical about this gigantic wilderness, this borealis, this huge circumpolar boreal forest that has resisted the advances of humanity and continues to do so even into this modern and postmodern age. It inspires something. And anybody who comes to the Boundary Waters or anybody who paddles the Boreal Forest, you know, they feel that. I think some people are frightened by it. I think some people can't get over the discomfort of being away from civilized comforts. And they never really allow themselves the experience of being here. It gets uh, all caught up in, you know, their own stuff. They're hot. They've got bug bites, you know. They're getting a sunburn. And so it kind of gets in the way of it. But most of the people who come to the Boundary Waters, who give it, give it an honest effort, they want to come back. Anyway, wow, wow, I've seen pictographs. I've seen the depictions of Nana Bush learning how to hunt from wolves and then teaching that to humans, of Nana Bush teaching humans how to use birch bark. There's also some thought that uh, that the largest panel on the Hagman pictographs, that the, that the person with the outstretched arms, that they also represent a mythical creature in the Ojibwe religion, religion called the Meimei Guiche, who are said to reside in cliffs and travel in stone canoes and to kind of be troublemakers. They play tricks on humans. So I'm on Treese Lake now. Mission one is accomplished. And now mission two begins. Travel what many consider to be the most difficult portage in the Boundary Waters. If not by length, it is the 10th longest portage in the Boundary Waters, then by conditions. So we're gonna find out exactly what that looks like here in just a moment. I am uh, in on Treese Lake. Treese Lake looks to be a relatively shallow, kind of swampy lake. So the portage is pretty easy to see. I can see that it's up here. It's on the north side of Treese Lake. It's kind of on the northeastern side. And I am now approaching that portage.
So I'm on Angleworm Lake. There are three campsites that are right on the Angleworm Trail. The first one is right as you come off the portage. And I don't want any of those three campsites because I typically do not like to camp on campsites that are connected to trails. Trails are trails for people, but they're also trails for animals like bear, like moose. And uh, I would like to see a bear or a moose from the canoe in the middle of the day as I'm traveling from one campsite to the next. I don't want to be near a moose superhighway or a bear superhighway. So I tend to avoid those kinds of campsites when I can. I mean, if that's all that's available, I'll take it. But in this case, there's a really, really nice looking campsite that is just beyond those three campsites. Rather than being on the western shore, it's on the eastern shore. And it looks as though it's got kind of a southwestern exposure, perhaps. And the wind is coming from the southwest right now, but it's relatively light. So I just hope, and that's a pretty good sign. It's 440. We have yet to have really heavy winds. Typically, if heavy winds are going to come, they would have already come by now. So things should just continue to calm down for the rest of the day, which means that the wind shouldn't be too big of a factor on the campsite. Um, although, you know, I've been wrong before. Anyway, I'm going to go to the campsite. I'm going to set things up and then I'm going to have myself a cup of coffee. And then while I'm drinking the coffee, I'll give you the full portage report on the completion of mission number two. Mission Coffee is a success. I've arrived at my camp on Angleworm. I've set up the tarp. I've set up the tent. I've settled in. It's about 7.30 and uh, I just got done making some coffee. I also went ahead and I got my supper on. I've got some homemade dehydrated spaghetti with uh, wide egg noodles. And I'm about to enjoy some coffee as I reflect upon that truly horrific portage and then I'm going to get right back to you and I'm going to tell you about what happened. That portage is is truly although it is it is merely the 10th longest portage in the Boundary Waters I've done other portages that are longer that weren't nearly as difficult. In fact, what I can say about most Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness portages is, is that, especially the longer ones, is that they tend to be relatively flat. If there is some up-down, there might be a long up and a long down. If there's some mud, it'll be relatively isolated. But this particular portage, not only was it 428 rod, which is more than a mile, but it in addition has just about every difficulty that you can possibly imagine. There was blowdown on the portage that had to be stepped over and then you are almost always going up or you're going down. These, we're talking dramatic, you know, stepping hard to go up and then bracing yourself as you go down. There is mud on the portage trail that is can only be described as epic and it goes on for maybe a football field or two. I could have easily gone up to my knee in mud in some of the places so in addition to that there is also a pretty serious navigational challenge. There's a point at which the the portage from the Angleworm parking lot entry point the portage from North Hagman and the Angleworm Trail all intersect in one spot. And that spot is, quite frankly, super duper confusing. What you need to do when you get to that spot is you need to take a right and you need to make sure that the large boulder is on your left. Not on your right. It needs to be on your left. 
When I first went through, I ended up walking about a half mile out of my way before I realized that I was walking straight west on either the angleworm trail itself or the trail leading to the angleworm entry parking lot. I would say that it is, uh, without question, it's the hardest portage trail that I've done in the Boundary Waters. It's not the longest. I've done longer. And I gotta do it again tomorrow. So, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Now at least I know what to expect. Part of the problem with the portage that made it so difficult for me is uh, a poor choice of footwear for a portage of that length. I'm wearing my muck boots, which are great for getting in and out of the canoe and great for keeping my feet warm in this cold water, but really, really bad for walking, you know, a long distance. So I walked three miles at least, and two of those miles I was carrying a canoe or a backpack, and that made the situation much worse. Um, and then my foot, my feet were getting wet because of the sweat, and then they started sliding around, and I developed a hot spot on my right foot uh, that I had to stop and I had to do some first aid on. So, difficult portage, but a good day. Accomplished two of the three missions. Arguably, I accomplished the third mission too, because I had an opportunity to, you know, walk around on the angleworm trail just a little bit, even if it wasn't intentional. It looks like a really nice trail. This is a really fantastic lake. It's got a lot of exposed rock on the shores, and it has a spectacular spot in the middle where the lake narrows. There are cliffs on either side that have to be probably 100 feet, maybe a little more than 100 feet. I'm camped right at the beginning of that narrow section, and so I can walk to the top of one of those cliffs just from the back of my campsite, which is really outstanding, really, really wonderful. And it's a great view. I've got a great plan for tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I'm gonna get up early and then get out on this water. I wanna, I wanna circumnavigate angleworm early in the morning when the wildlife might just be waking up. I'm really looking forward to paddling underneath these huge cliffs that are right behind me here. And then after I have that satisfying paddle in the morning, I'll come back here and I'll go ahead and I'll make up some pancakes. So I don't think that I'll be going onto the Angleworm Trail tomorrow. Unfortunately, it's a third mission that uh, I'm probably just not gonna have time to accomplish. But then that gives me a reason to come back here. And I think that any reason to come back to this area is a good reason to come back. So I'll look forward to that. I think that uh, that's it for me tonight. Thanks again for sticking with me on this day two. For now, good night.
been a wonderful morning. And now, I'm probably about two miles away from campsite, which is where I need to return to so that I can make pancakes and have a proper breakfast. I've only had a bar so far. And I'm starting to get a little hungry. I have food with me, but I would prefer to eat pancakes. I gotta be honest with you. I got three really big pancakes. That was the first time that I actually used maple sugar and turned it into maple syrup out here. And I was, uh, I was happy with the result. It came out really well. I was particularly happy that I used um, very little alcohol fuel to make three pancakes. I was really surprised. So yeah, it's been a really good morning. I mean, I got up super early at 5 a.m. I liked that plan. I loved getting out on the water. Um, just as the sun was coming up when there wasn't a lot of wind yet. It was fun to look at look for wildlife I did see an owl and I saw a beaver climb into the water But I'm still learning to get my camera out fast enough to be able to take a photo or to be able to get video of those things I'm getting better at being able to capture the wildlife, but it was a great great paddle Going all the way up to the top of angleworm and seeing where it ends with that beaver dam it's been, water levels here are very interesting. Uh, in When I was at the Kuishui last weekend, the water levels were super, super high. Here they seem like they're a little low, actually, based upon the lichens on the rocks. But, you know, maybe that's just part and parcel to how this place is special. These cliffs that are here over on the west side are totally unique. I have not had a chance to see these kinds of towering cliffs. I understand why the Ojibwe considered cliffs sacred places where the sky meets the water meets the land. And they do, they all come together in a really, really awesome spectacle, especially in the morning light like it was today. So it was a really, really great paddle. I had a wonderful, wonderful breakfast. I'm well hydrated, I'm well fed, and I'm feeling ready to move. So the next time you'll see me, I'll be getting on the water and heading to the Portage Trail.
Well, that was a lot easier. Knowing what to expect helped. I had the bow, I had the right mindset and I had prepared myself appropriately to do it. It's still a difficult portage. I would still call it one of the most difficult portages in the Boundary Waters, but I got through it. I'm on the other side, I'm on North Hagman now. I'm about ready to go past the pictographs here the second time. I'll make a tobacco offering. In the meantime, we've had a great trip. We've accomplished three missions. I'll talk a little bit more about those as I continue to make progress. I'm just coming out of the channel that connects trees to North Hagman Lake. I just went past the pictographs, I made my offering, and now I'm on North Hagman, headed toward the portage. It is um, an increasingly beautiful day for paddling. It's been, it started off clear blue skies with some cumulus clouds. Those cumulus clouds have developed over the course of the day. Now we have cumulus congestus clouds. That is piling up cumulus clouds. Some of them are dropping their moisture and the sky is beautifully duplicatus. There's layers and layers of clouds up there. Really nice, should be a good sunset. I won't be here to see it because I'm on my way out and I'm concluding this mission. Passing the pictographs reminds me of the things we learned. One, they were painted by the Ojibwa. Two, they are holy and in fact are painted in holy places. Three, they depict religiously important stories of the Ojibwa religion. Four, they were painted by shaman who, according to Ojibwa, they are the mediators between the world of Manitou or the world of the spirits and the human world after two epochs. The first epoch, humans were just a dream. The world was ruled by monsters. In the second epoch, humans could talk to animals and Nanabazoo came to help humans learn how to live from the animals. And in the epoch, third epoch, humans could no longer speak to animals. Nanabazoo had gone. And now people need mediators. The Anishinaabe people use mediators called shaman who help communicate the spirit world to them through things like the pictographs that I'm so happy I was finally able to see. I'm so happy that you came along with me. So thank you for that. That was the first mission. The second mission was to accomplish a very difficult portage. I'm gonna say that that was the most difficult. The third was to explore angleworm and that was successfully accomplished. Not as much on the trail, but the lake was more than enough. And for the first time being there, I think that it was more important to explore the lake. I, I am looking forward to that trail. However, that trail is a little spooky. People get lost on it all the time. I got lost on it a little bit. I, I got found right away, but I got lost a little bit. And there's one story of a man who went there in the shoulder season when it was cold. He went backpacking. He was an experienced outdoors person. He disappeared and when the search party went out for him, all they found were his clothes. He had taken off all his clothes and nobody ever found the body. So nobody knows really what happened to him, but the hypothesis is that he got hypothermia, dropped his clothes, walked into the woods, and then was probably scavenged. I did see a lot of wolf scat on those trails, so there certainly is probably a wolf pack around that would have scavenged at the very least. You know, then there's all the turkey vultures and all the other creatures that scavenge. So there's something about that place. I felt it. It's a magical place. Angleworm is a beautiful and magical place. This has been a good mission. I'm so glad that you came along. I really hope that you tune in for future missions. It's great to bring you out here with me. It's uh, not so lonely when I've got somebody to talk to and somebody to turn to when I see something beautiful. So. Thank you again for coming along with me. If you like this video, you know, just, just like it. You have a good one and I'll see you next time.